Hello, good morning, and welcome to the Southeast Climate Monthly Webinar. My name is Meredith Muth, and I am a regional coordinator with the National Integrated Drought Information System, one of the several organizers of this monthly webinar series, including the Southeast Regional Climate Center and the National Weather Service. For today's webinar, we will have our um, usual round of speakers at the beginning. First, we're going to have a climate overview of what happened last month, current conditions, and looking ahead, as well as a tropical update, looking at the tropical season in review. And for this, we welcome a special guest today, David Searden from the Florida Climate Center. He will be stepping in, and thank you very much, David, for our normal speaker, Sandra Rain, who just had a baby girl and is on maternity leave. So congratulations to Sandra. Um, we will then be followed up with a water resources overview from Jeff Dober from the National Weather Service Southeast River Forecast Center. And then Pam Knox from the University of Georgia will provide an agricultural impact update. And today's special presentation is on high tide flooding and sea level rise by William Sweet, from the National Ocean Service of NOAA. As a reminder, we will have a question and answer period at the end of the webinar, so please feel free as we go to, to put in any kind of questions or comments you have in the question box. We also have a number of experts online ready to answer any questions related to climate in the Southeast, uh, even if it was not discussed specifically in today's webinar. And a reminder that we will be sending out a link to this recording as well as a recap email um, by tomorrow. And with that, let's go ahead and get started. David? All right, yeah, thank you very much, Meredith. Uh, I will be talking about kind of a recap of the uh, tropical season in the Atlantic Basin and also a, a climate overview from both the month of November and the climatological fall season as a whole uh, of September through November throughout the Southeast. Uh, so with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm taking a chance and playing an animation that was put together by Jacob Karsten here at FSU, a very bright PhD student. And it's a loop of all the five day tropical outlooks from the National Hurricane Center beginning in late May and going through the end of the season. And it really illustrates what a record active season we have had this year. And what's also impressive is the number of these red, uh, red and orange blobs, which were forecast to have a high probability of development, how many of those actually did go ahead and develop into a named tropical system. Uh, so we'll go ahead and let this run out. It only takes a minute or two, but now you see just how incredibly active this Atlantic season was. So we'll go ahead and advance to the new, next slide as this finishes up. Uh, again, this just shows uh, the hurricane or the tracks from all the named tropical systems this year. Uh, kind of same thing we saw on the animation. Again, a very active year where all regions, uh, all regions that are usually favorable formation uh, did indeed generate a lot of storms. So on the next slide, we'll kind of give a recap. And this information was compiled by Phil Klotzbach at Colorado State University. Uh, we did have 30 named storms, which was a record, uh, certainly since the satellite era, but overall in the HERDAT data set, it is the, the most named storms in a year. Uh, we ranked third as far, far as named storm days, uh, tied for second with the number of hurricanes and major hurricanes this year. Uh, not quite as high when we look at other measures like accumulated cyclone energy, where much of the first part of the season, we were actually near normal in spite of a record pace on the number of named storms. But also we did have 12 U.S. landfalls for named storms, six at hurricane strength, and the 12 landfalls is yet again another record. So 
on the next slide, uh, we'll take a look. And this graphic was put together by uh, National Weather Service Office in Corpus Christi. And it shows all the watches and warnings that were issued this year where uh, trop at least a tropical watch or warning was in place for every coastal county uh, from the border of Mexico up through Maine, with the exception of just a few counties here uh, south of uh, Tallahassee along the Florida Panhandle, the only area of the coast that did not have a watch or warning this year. Uh, so we'll go to the next slide and wrap it up. Uh, we did have uh, a tropical storm make landfall actually twice in the month of November since our last webinar. Uh, I believe Ada was spinning around in the Southeast Gulf at the time of our last webinar. Uh, but again, it did make landfall twice, once in the Florida Keys and again along the nature coast of, uh, of Florida along the Gulf Coast. Uh, the main impacts from this tropical storm was heavy rainfall. Over on the right, we see radar estimates uh, of the rainfall two and three day totals from Tropical Storm Ada, over 16 inches in some parts of Broward County. Uh, the remnants also kind of merged with a, a mid-latitude trough and brought heavy rainfall to portions of the Carolinas, uh, the lower Appalachians. So with that, we'll go ahead and, and go to the next slide and talk about uh, some record warm temperatures we've seen this fall across the Southeast. And this is from uh, the Southeast Regional Climate Center's Climate Perspectives tool. And it shows the historical rankings for average temperature station by station for the month of November on the far left, for the fall season as a whole in the middle, and year to date since January 1st over on the right. And for the month of month November, we see a few stations recorded their record warmest November, Dothan, Alabama, Crestview, Florida, uh, Lumberton, North Carolina, but many of the others ranked in certainly the top five or even the top two or three warmest Novembers on record. But if we look at the fall season as a whole, now we see a lot more number one rankings, especially in South and Central Florida, extending up uh, along the coast of Georgia and the Carolinas, Savannah running record warm. Uh, so by many measures, we've had, uh, many of these stations have had a record warm fall season, and it looks likely that Florida may have ex experienced its warmest fall season on record. But uh, if we look at year to date, it really stands out how many, many stations in Florida are, are running uh, number one, through the 1st of December. Uh, I thought at first there was, it was a slam dunk that we'd have our warmest calendar year ever in the state of Florida. But since late November and through December, we've had some seasonably cooler temperatures. So it might turn out closer than I thought as we get to the end of December. Uh, but still, you see the record warmth up through the Southeast Atlantic coast, the outer banks of North Carolina, and even inland in inland Georgia and Alabama. On the next slide, this is something that really stands out. This continues a trend we've seen over the past several years, five to 10 years, that it's actually the overnight minimum temperatures that are warming more than the daytime high temperatures. And this shows the temperature anomalies by station for the fall season, again, September through November. Over on the left is the maximum temperature anomalies, which are generally one, two to three degrees above normal. But over on the right, the minimum temperature anomalies are five, six, seven, even a couple stations with eight degree anomalies for the overnight minimum temperatures. So once again, it just continues a trend of warming overnight temperatures that we've seen over the last several years or even decade. On the next slide, we'll start taking a look at precipitation. And this shows the de rainfall departures from normal for the month of November on the left and for the fall season over on the right. And for, for November, uh, the peninsula of Florida and the Carolinas were mostly above normal, uh, anywhere from one to three or even up to five to six inches above normal in some locations, especially in South Florida. Uh, inland Georgia and Alabama, 
a little below normal, but it's fairly seasonal. This is the uh, the dry season uh, here in the southeast United States. Over on the far right shows the precipitation anomalies for the fall season, and there it really sticks out. You you see the very very heavy rainfall up to 12 inches above normal along southeast Florida, uh, six to 12 inches above normal portions of the Florida Panhandle, uh, the, the lower Appalachian Mountains, and the Piedmont area of North Carolina into Virginia. On the next slide, we'll, let's not forget about our, our, our friends in uh, Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands, uh, where fall temperatures and rainfall were fairly close to number, I'm, I'm sorry, close to normal. The top map shows the average temperature, average fall temperature uh, for these stations and pretty much what you'd expect for fall in the Caribbean, uh, only a degree or two anomalies, if, if that much. Uh, the bottom map shows rainfall totals for the fall season. What stands out is uh, Juncos in, in uh, eastern Puerto Rico uh, with 34.14 inches over the fall, which is 9.1 inches above normal. And Christiansted in the Virgin Islands was actually only 10.77 inches of rainfall, which was 4.8 inches below normal. So kind of a mixed bag for rainfall in Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. So with the next slide, we'll, we'll take a look at the drought situation in the Southeast, according to the US Drought Monitor. And here we see uh, no real drought, but several areas of uh, D0 or abnormally dry across Southern and Eastern Georgia and Southern Alabama. Uh, this area along uh, kind of the eastern Georgia coast has been the most persistent area of abnormally dry throughout the fall season. The other blotches of D0 are more transient and tend to come and go, which is really consistent with the scattered nature of, uh, of warm season convective rainfall in inland Georgia and Alabama. So on the next slide, we'll start looking ahead at the seasonal climate outlook. And especially here in the Southeast, the first thing we look to is the state of the Pacific Ocean or the, the phase of the El Nino-La Nina cycle. And here I have a current sea surface temperature anomalies across the Pacific, which shows uh, much colder than normal waters all the way from the coast of South America, extending along the equator uh, to the other side of the international date line. Uh, very strong cold anomalies and very coherent pattern consistent with the moderate to strong La Nina conditions that we've been in for the past several months. And on the bottom is the graph of the Nino 3.4 index that most of us are familiar with. And it shows uh, since mid-October, it's been hovering around that negative one and a half degree uh, Celsius threshold, which is a pretty commonly ex accepted threshold uh, for a strong La Nina event. So this shows where the La Nina conditions are well in place, have been for a couple months now. And as we'll see on the next slide, uh, because it's such a strong and widespread event, it's, it's sure to continue at least through the winter months and well into the spring. Over on the left is the official probabilistic forecast uh, for the Nino 3.4 region from CP NOAA's Climate Prediction Center and IRI. And it shows a 100% chance of continued La Nina conditions through the December, January, February timeframe. As we get into the spring of the year, the chances of continued La Nina conditions start to lessen, but it's still well over 50%, up to 65% as we enter into the March, April, May season. So this kind of follows the typical life cycle of an El Nino or La Nina event that tend to subside in the spring of the year, but it's also a fairly, a very strong forecast for continued La Nina conditions well into the spring. And over on the right just shows the different prediction models for the Nino 3.4 region. And consistent with the seasonal cycle, they most of them show us, show the anomalies warming as we get into the spring of the year, and maybe even a transition into new, neutral conditions as we get into the summer 
of 2021. So on the next slide, we'll keep in mind the, the classic La Nina impacts for the in North America and for the Southeast United States. On the top of the top right is kind of our conceptual model that uh, La Nina tends to strengthen the polar jet stream and it favors a configuration of, of um, high pressure ridging over the eastern Pacific and the Gulf of Alaska, but mean troughing over the central and eastern United States. This usually leads to a storm track that kind of goes up the, the Mississippi and Ohio River valleys but that storm track tends to keep the, the Southeast United States, in fact, the whole Southern tier of the US actually warmer and drier than normal. Uh, so that's kind of the classic impacts of, of La Nina and our conceptual model. But something we struggle with in the Apalachicola, Chattahoochee, Flint basin and our drought early warning system there is when we have La Nina conditions, where exactly is this storm track gonna set up? If it's a little bit further south, we can actually get enhanced rainfall over northern Alabama and northern Georgia and the upper ACF basin. However, over on the left, I put together a composite of all the strong La Nina events, and it's a composite of rainfall from November through March of the year. And this, again, a composite for all the strong La Nina events since 1950. And this shows that the drier than normal conditions during strong events tend to extend all the way up through northern Georgia and very strong through the southern Appalachians. Uh, so it, it looks a little more likely that, that the storm track will be a little further north than during normal La Nina events. So with this in mind, we'll go to the next slide and take a look at the official NOAA CPC outlooks. Uh, for December, January, and February, the next three months. Over on the left is the temperature outlook, which strongly favors warmer than normal temperatures across the whole southern tier of the United States. Again, very consistent with the can canonical La Nina impacts. And over on the right is the precipitation outlook, again, strongly favoring below normal precipitation over the Florida Peninsula, the Northern Gulf Coast, Texas, and New Mexico. So with this forecast in mind, the last thing we'll look at is the seasonal drought outlook. And all the areas in brown are currently in drought. So they are forecast for the, this drought to persist as we go through the winter influenced by La Nina. But also the areas in yellow is where drought, drought development is likely as we go through this winter. And this is one of the stronger forecasts I've seen from this product with Southern California, a broad area of the Southeastern United States, Eastern Texas and Oklahoma, all forecasts for drought to develop in the next one to three months. So with that, I'll go ahead and wrap up with my summary points. Uh, we just wrapped up a record Atlantic hurricane season. It should be coming to a close as we're now a week past the official end and we've had several cold fronts cooling the, the sea surface temperatures in the Gulf of Mexico and, and Northwest Caribbean. So hopefully we can write a book on this record season. Uh, we've also experienced record heat in 2020 uh, for much of Florida, the coastal Carolinas, and this continued through the fall season. Fall rainfall was well above normal for most of the Southeast, heaviest over Southern Florida, the Southern App Appalachians and the Piedmont of North Carolina where rainfall anomalies were six to 12 inches above normal. Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Islands were near normal for fall rainfall and temperature. Uh, Looking at the US drought monitor, pockets of D0 came and went throughout the late summer and fall and uh, throughout the Southeast. Uh, the current area in coastal and Eastern Georgia has been the most persistent. Uh, we are in a La Nina advisory, uh, according to NOAA's Climate Prediction Center and 100% chance of it continuing through winter and 65% through spring. And with this in mind, the CPC seasonal forecast favors above normal temperatures and below normal rainfall 
throughout most of the Southeast. And with that, I'll go ahead and hand it off to Jeff Dober with the Southeast uh, River Forecast Center for our water resource outlook. Okay, great. Thank you, David. And uh, here's what's going on right now across the Southeast. These are the USGS 28 day average stream flows. And you can see across the, the Southeast states, we're well above, uh, well above normal uh, to uh, much above normal across the Carolinas, as well as Florida. Uh, as David pointed out, the heavy rain that we had during mid-November associated with Ada and that uh, long wave uh, rainfall system that came through brought a lot of heavy rain. We're still seeing a lot of lingering effects uh, from, from, uh, from that rain event mid-November in the Carolinas. As far as the Florida Peninsula, we're above average there. We've seen rain. This is, as David pointed out, this is their dry season as we go into December. So it uh, doesn't necessarily mean they have high flows right now. It's just they're above normal relative to their low flows, uh, which they're going into as, as we go into that December, January dry season across the Florida Peninsula. Uh, but the graph to the uh, to the right there shows that we've been pretty much above normal uh, across most of the southeast as an average uh, from September uh, for most of the fall, and um, that will likely continue into the December period as we'll um, if we go on to the next slide here, as we'll show. Uh, but right now our current conditions, as far as flood conditions, right now we have some lingering minor flooding in the low country of South Carolina. And again, some of this is still from uh, mid-November's rains and, and uh, we had a rainfall event in, uh, right around the, the end of November and into early December. Uh, some of these are just lingering effects uh, as the water has made its way down uh, these, these rivers. But overall, uh, pretty much a quiet period right now uh, uh, for the first week in December as far as flooding. If we go to the next slide, this is typically where we are at. This is the graph for uh, the weekly river flood climatology, and we're in week 50 right now for December 8th. And you can see on average, uh, we start to uptick as the jet stream shifts a little bit further uh, south and into our area. We start to get some of these rain systems start to affect the southeast, especially uh, the upper portion of the southeast states. And uh, we start to see some increase in the number of floods. This is sort of the beginning of our primary flood season. And this lingers in through the month of December. And then we start to see a ramp up here uh, in February and March. Uh, typical river flood climatology, river flood season for the southeast. Go to the next slide. And here's our, so here's our stream flow forecast for December. And as I pointed out, we're gonna continue the trends that we're seeing uh, currently with above normal stream flows uh, across the Carolinas and above normal in the, in the Florida Peninsula, uh, but near normal across Georgia and Alabama uh, and the Florida Panhandle uh, with, as David pointed out, maybe even some, uh, some uh, potentially below normal uh, developing um, in some of the coastal coastal rivers of the Florida plant, uh, Florida uh, Panhandle as we go toward the end of December into January and February. And if we go to the next slide here, this will give us a look into the rest of the winter. So as David pointed out, uh, the La Nina typically brings some drier weather for the winter period. And uh, so we're expecting some of those above normal stream flows to settle into the near normal range across the Carolinas, uh, as well as the Florida uh, Panhandle and, and really across all the region. Again, the only exceptions would be across the Florida Panhandle where we could see maybe some rivers go trending, especially in the January, February trending in the below normal range. And then the other caveat, as David pointed out, uh, that the, the probably the most uncertainty is in the Carolinas. And this is regarding La Nina and that dividing line between the wet and dry axis. Uh, if that's a little bit further south with the wet weather, we could see maybe some chances above, above normal uh, stream flows. 
especially in the Schwann in the southern Virginia area, the upper Roanoke, which uh, a lot of these rivers, of course, lead themselves down in the coastal regions in North Carolina. That's where we could see some lingering above normal stream flows. But uh, for overall, it looks like near normal. Um, and go to the next slide and I'll give you my summary. So stream flows remaining above normal across the Carolinas, Florida, and near normal for Georgia and Alabama. But then we'll see this trend toward near normal across most of the Southeast region as we go through the winter months of January and February. And that's all I had. So I will pass it on to Pam. All right, well, thank you. And uh, good morning, everybody. I'm going to jump right in here to make sure we have time for our special guests. So let me just remind you that uh, some of this David has already covered. For the last month or so, we've been considerably above normal for temperature. And as David pointed out, especially at night, uh, rainfall has been mixed with the eastern part of the region mostly wet uh, from Ada and the, the um, front that pushed through that was just after that, whereas the western part has been quite dry. And so that has had some impacts on agriculture. Go to the next slide. Um, just a couple of things that I like to look at. The, the drought tendency forecast shows that because of the dry conditions across the Southeast, um, there are a number of spots here that have been flagged for the potential for flash drought. And you know that's very consistent with what the, the drought folks have said for uh, our prediction for the likelihood of drought to develop over the winter. Um, it's interesting to note that if you look at the lawn and garden moisture index, uh, actually those areas that are shown as potential for flash drought have been quite wet over the last few days. And so they're not showing any incipient uh, drought, but it's certainly something to watch for. Florida has been fairly dry, but it's that time of year. If we go on. Some of the impacts of the recent conditions on agriculture, most peanuts are already harvested. Uh, they're still working on cotton and pecans because it's been a really heavy year for pecans. Soybeans, most of those are well over 50% harvested now. Um, done a lot of planting of strawberries and vegetables. Um, and the livestock producers have been planting forage, uh, which has been helped by the wet conditions in the areas that have had the rain. Um, and same thing for small grains and uh, onions. Onions like it dry, but they have to have some moisture to get started in the fall. We go on. Just a little bit more on ADA and agriculture. You can see that crazy path that David showed earlier on his slides. And this is the day-by-day -day rainfall from November 10 through November 13. Um, so you can see that it really caused a long time period in some areas with quite a bit of rain, especially in that eastern part of the region. Uh, heavy rain hit down in Florida just at the time when they're doing a lot of harvesting of Thanksgiving vegetables. And so um, they lost an estimated 85 to 320 million from those losses, mostly because of the heavy rain, not so much from wind. Uh, winds did cause some problems with sugarcane being flattened. And those wet conditions have really increased plant diseases and slug damage. They like, they like the wet conditions as well. So that's caused some issues as well. Um, they're certainly concerned about carryover of that over the winter if it's gonna be as warm as we think. We go on. Uh, this is a, a product that I wanted to put out for the, those of you who are interested in, in peach farming or, or looking at fruit farming over the winter. One of the things they really watch for is something called chill hours, which is basically the number of hours that the temperature is below about 45 degrees. And this is a product from agroclimate.org um, that shows the accumulated chill hours over time. This one happens to be for Peach County, Georgia, which is just south of Macon in the middle of the state. And it shows um, on the graph, the yellow is the, the normal accumulation of chill hours uh, for that location. The sort of green is from last year, which you can see started out relatively close to normal. And then as the winter got warmer, the chill hours really dropped. And then this year with the warm fall, the, the accumulations of chill hours have been a lot below normal. You can see the pretty big uptake there as the, at the end as we've gone towards a colder pattern. And then the blue envelope is all the previous La Ninas and you know where the chill hours would have fallen out. So even though we're behind right now, there's still a good chance that we could get a decent number of chill hours this year. But it's something that farmers are gonna watch. If you don't have any chill hours, the trees tend not to put out a lot of blossoms. And so you get lower fruit, fruit yield from that. 
So if you're growing fruit and you're interested in that for your own area, this only covers Florida and Georgia, um, but um, something that's a very useful product, I think. And the website there is on the bottom. Go to the next slide. Uh, some of the threats to agriculture in the coming weeks. The product here on the left shows the number of days with the minimum temperature at or below 30 degrees Fahrenheit. And if it's blue, it means it's non-zero, which means that for most of the region now, they've had at least one, degree, one day where the temperatures drop below 30, which is basically the end of the growing season. The only exception to that is down in the Florida Peninsula. Um, and so, you know, we're looking at that, the growing season is over. There's some crops like brassicas, cabbage, and broccoli, and so on, that like the cooler weather, but most things are not doing, uh, doing any more growing at this point. Tropics are really settling down. We can't discount anything, but so far it looks pretty, pretty quiet. I don't really expect to see a lot more activity from the tropics this year. We're past the end of the official season, but that's never stopped the Atlantic before. Um, and the drier conditions that we've seen are good for cotton harvest. Uh, they they need it to be uh, dry and sunny, and so um, that's been good. It's not so good if you're trying to establish a winter crop and you need more moisture. Go on. Here's my summary. Uh, the drier conditions have helped complete the peanut harvest, but have hindered the establishment of winter grains and forage. Hurricane Ada brought a lot of rain and caused some crop losses, tree damage, and power outages in some locations. Not much more expected from the tropical season. The chill hours are running well below normal so far, but the recent cold has been helping with that. And the La Nina has the potential to affect the spring planting because we'll have likely dry conditions in the spring. That could cause some problems for germination of soil, uh, of seeds in the spring. Um, also cause some problems with early blossoming of plants, uh, potentially making them more vulnerable to a frost, even if it's not that early of a frost. And warm winter could mean more pests in the spring because they're just going to be able to overwinter better if it doesn't get really cold. So that's all I've got. And from here on, we go to our special guest. All right. Good morning, all. Um, thanks for the opportunity to present. Um, we will now take it to the coastline and, and talk about sea level rise and high tide flooding, uh, specifically as it's impacting uh, the southeast coast, and I'll give a few specific uh, plots and references to Charleston, uh, piggybacking on a presentation we gave there a few months ago. Um, so to back up, my name is William Sweet. I work for the National Ocean Service. Um, so I'm day to day looking at the tide gauge data and making sense of what sea level is doing and how is that impacting our communities. Um, from the pictures, you can see uh, flooding of many uh, different areas within Charleston is fairly routine. Um, and what you will notice in most of these is it's not raining. However, um, when rain occurs, it's a problem. Uh, sea level has risen to the point that it's clogging stormwater drains. Uh, the groundwater tables are higher, especially in areas in South Florida as well. Uh, when it rains, unless there's a, an active pump system, oftentimes water just isn't going anywhere. And the water actually may be coming out through storm drains and uh, surfacing under just the influence of sea level um, and the, the sort of reverse pressure it's putting uh, inland. Next slide, please. Um, so I'll talk specifically about a report we put out this summer. Um, it's a multi-year uh, series now. I think this is the sixth report where we are providing, uh, sort of doing a recap of what's happened over the last year, as well as giving an outlook for the next year. Uh, similar to the discussions and what we've had thus far, uh, as well as going out to 2030 and 2050 to give uh, sort of a likely uh, range of impacts and flooding that is likely to occur. Uh, so folks can not only plan for next year, uh, bud budgeting responses just to, to know uh, with that information and do as you wish, uh, as well as, you know, what's likely to unfold over the next couple decades. Um, so uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> Sea level rise, uh, we know it's rising. Uh, we measure it uh, from many different sources. Uh, we measure it from space and we can really get a good uh, estimate as globally of what's occurring as well as regionally. Uh, we know the sources of why it's rising. Uh, on a rough estimate, it's about uh, one part thermal expansion as the ocean heat, as the ocean absorbs heat and two parts melt. 
um, for melting of land-based ice uh, glaciers and Greenland and Antarctica ice sheets. Uh, but what's really important is what's going on at the coast. So the tide gauges measure not only what the ocean is doing, but also what land is doing. And for a large part of the southeast coast, uh, in particular, uh, sort of the South Carolina and some of the Georgia, uh, land is subsiding. Part of that is due to reclaimed land that a lot of these cities have been built on, might be settling. Uh, nonetheless, it's the combination of the two, land and ocean, as to what's causing relative sea level rise. And Here's a long-term plot of rise in Charleston, about an inch every eight years, though, as you can tell over the last uh, decade or so, rates are really sort of deviating from uh, that trend line, and that is to be expected by the projections we'll show here in a bit. Next slide, please. Um, and what we're doing is we're translating uh, sea level rise in, uh, into a context that makes sense to people. We're trying to pair this with thresholds that uh, have been developed and are used to communicate uh, impending uh, uh, conditions, flooding, coastal flooding, established by the weather forecast offices along the United States coastline of the National Weather Service at NOAA. Uh, we've done some statistical uh, analysis of these and sort of a best, best solution, a fit solution to these. Uh, and so I'll talk about high tide flooding and that threshold is close to the moderate level in Charleston, uh, as well as other areas in the southeast Florida. So it's it's fairly noticeable. It's not outright damaging or destructing, but the cumulative nature of these impacts are becoming uh, more than a disruption, and they're actually starting to put negative pressure on on property values, and it's forcing upgrades to stormwater systems and et cetera. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we've been mapping uh, the Office of Coast Management, Sea Level Rise Viewer has been mapping the land elevations at or below these thresholds, so potentially exposed to this type of flooding. Um, and as you see here, blow up Charleston, uh, there's a lot of land. A lot of this would be marsh, but a lot is not. And I think the citizens of that community in particular can testify as to uh, that it's fairly widespread, very noticeable. Uh, and, and changes that have been uh, very apparent over the last decade or two. Uh, but you can zoom in and get sort of a sense of what could, what's uh, potentially at risk, does not mean it's always going to be wet, but uh, definitely at an elevation that is susceptible to this type of flooding. Next slide, please. Uh, so with that, uh, last year, so 2019, and this is a meteorological year, we keep the winter season intact. So this would have been from uh, May of 2019 through April of 2020. Uh, what we show here are areas that broke or tied all time records for a number of high tide flood days. And you can see uh, up and down the South Atlantic coast. Um, and if you look at sea surface heights in these areas, sea levels have been on the rise. And in fact, the majority of all of these locations as well as almost all of them on the East coast uh, broke records for all-time high sea levels, so just sort of the accumulating rise of sea over the since the measurements have begun. Uh, it's really starting to stack up and it's spilling into the streets more often than not under a garden variety of reasons such as changes in prevailing winds. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and so what's happening is our flood defenses are at a certain height. Uh, they've They've changed through time. Uh, but uh, right now, they sort of this high tide flood threshold represents current flood elevations. And if you can click twice, or one, one more, you can see that what's changed is the height of the water. Uh, and now, what used to be uh, flooding under a rare event is now fairly common. Uh, and that's the way sea level is playing out. It's a change in frequency of, of flooding that are lesser in extreme, but again, starting to accumulate in terms of, of impacts. Uh, next slide, please. And so if you see sort of that on the slide prior, there's that red bracketed, that's your distribution. That's sort of more or less where the bulk of your daily max water levels fall. Uh, there are the extremes out on the tail uh, that you, we would quantify in a different set of statistics, but here we're just sort of showing that probability distribution the area under each one of those curves would represent 365 days per year due to increase in sea level rise. The risk of flooding of all severities has increased. However, you can see at the minor or the high tide flood threshold is getting to that very non-linear part 
of the curve there. And so what that means is uh, impacts are growing with leap and bound, and we actually measure that. Next slide, please. Uh, when we take daily days above this threshold on an annual basis and fit them statistically and uh, more than uh, somewhere 40 or 50 locations on the Ethan Gulf Coast now are accelerating. So whether or not sea levels accelerating impacts are, and that's a fit of a quadratic. And with at least the time that we made these outlooks in May, June, neutral, and so neutral, El Nino, La Nino, uh, neutral conditions were predicted, though we just have heard earlier in the talk, strong La Nina are predicted. That doesn't really affect our outlook on the East Coast or Gulf Coast. Uh, that might impact a bit on the on the west coast but right now the sea levels have been higher than normal even on the west coast uh we're not seeing a drop that we typically would during la nina so more or less right now it's it's a continuation of this trend plus or minus two standard deviation so that provides us a way of statistically providing sort of a a change in baseline and that would be the outlook for charleston uh and what what i'm showing here on the bottom is you know the statistics don't lie um and, and they are calibrated to what uh, the weather service uses on the ground and what i'm showing here in the orange uh, plots are uh, uh, column plots are advisories and warnings coastal flood advisory and warnings put out by the charleston weather forecast office and you can see that they pretty closely follow suit uh, they're issuing more warnings and advisories than ever uh, broke their record since the sort of robust nature of archiving has occurred at the weather service and that was a case, I think, at seven other WFOs along the eastern Gulf Coast uh, issuing all-time records, number of these events. So it's really not warning fatigue. It's called, it's real flooding. It's happening more and more due to sea level rise. Next slide, please. Uh, and so when we just sort of quantify what's going on uh, on the upper left is we can see the percent increase in trends in 19 uh, versus 2000 so not the actual value that happened in 2000 but the statistical fit its value in 2000 so to sort of honor the data and not try to cherry pick so what we've seen is increases two three four five hundred percent increases over the last couple decades uh, so for instance you know charleston it might be it went from three or four to upwards of nine to ten a 300 percent increase and on the upper right is this accelerating nature uh, so it's basically on a year-to-year -year basis, impacts are accelerating, and that's sea level. Next slide, please. Uh, and then with the sea level rise scenarios in the United States, when we apply this, next slide, we can downscale that for Charleston, and, and the red shaded area is the more likely outcomes, sort of the intermediate low to intermediate, so that's adopted by the Fourth National Climate Assessment and tracking suit of what the sea levels are actually doing so that's sort of your more likely outcomes and the bottom plot is then what does that mean in terms of high tide flooding you know the moderate scale impacts that they're experiencing assuming no changes in flood defenses uh, and you can see uh, you know 365 days per year at some point uh, but in the next couple decades uh, definitely a rapid uh, acceleration is expected to continue uh, on the last slide please uh, out, uh, Outlook, a website that we've created at uh, the Center for Operational Oceanographic Products and Services, co-ops at National Ocean Services, providing this, and you can click on uh, any one of the uh, stations there, upwards of 100, and you can get, you know, what happened last year, what was the normal in 2000, what's the outlook for next year, and then 2030 and 2050, and you can see that, uh, you know, flooding is here, it's projected just to increase uh you know and this kind of information is not uh we're not putting this out to alarm we're putting out to inform so that decisions that depend on this uh have sort of this authoritative consistent sets of information to make decisions and we've already heard from folks like mark wilbert the chief resilience officer in charleston that this is very helpful um you know as they plan uh you know major upgrades as well as budgeting for next year's types of responses since there's very clear trends. The signal to noise in the sea level uh, uh, high tide flooding is is much different, uh, or at least at a local level, than it is a lot of the other parameters of rainfall and and, and temperature and so forth. It's a clear trend, uh, and uh, the futures here sea level rise impacts, and this is why we're providing what we're providing. Uh, so with that, that's the last slide. Thank you.
Great, thank you so much, Dr. Sweet, for joining us today for that overview of high tide flooding. Um, what we'd like to do now is we have some time for some question and answers. If you have any questions, please enter it into the box. And while we're waiting for those, just a reminder that our next webinar is January 12th at 10 a.m. and we're gonna have a special presentation on prescribed fires, specifically in the unique Florida context. You can register for upcoming webinars with the link listed. And again, a re webinar recording and a recap email will be sent out by tomorrow of today's presentation. If you have any questions or comments to, to improve this webinar, please feel free to contact me or take the survey. It's a very short survey um, once you close the GoToWebinar. And with that, I would like to once again thank very much our speakers, David Zierden, our guest speaker for the Climate Overview, Pam Knox for Agriculture, Jeff Dober for Water, and Billy Sweet as our special topic for high tide flooding. And with that, we're going to start with our questions. We actually do not have any questions right now. We have a very quiet group on a December. Um, we do have one comment related to the weather in Florida. Okay, Billy, I have a question for you. Uh, Dr. Sweet, you mentioned that the contribution of melt is much higher than thermal expansion. When did it increase to that level? A good question. Uh, it started overtaking uh, the thermal expansion part uh, about the 1990s or so. Um, so really, at the, there's a plot if if you're interested in the BAMS, the annual state of the climate review, where we kind of provide the track of the of uh, as as well as going to the NASA sea level change portal team. But in short, a few decades ago, uh, and now that contribution, uh, we'll say three decades ago, now that contribution is is uh, clearly uh, dominated by melt, and that is uh, the the wild card at this point. You know, you get to the higher scenarios, and that's largely going to be dependent upon just how much melt occurs. Thank you. I have another question related to tide flooding. Can the increased frequency of tide floods have an impact on a more global scale? Uh, uh, yes, short answer is, you know, increased frequency of tidal flooding is occurring um, on, on a global scale. And we are monitoring this to an extent um, with the Department of Defense, we're doing similar work with them developing um, databases where they can sort of get probabilities of the rare and the more common uh, event and what the probabilities and how those are likely to change. So it's just not a Southeast coast. It's pretty much wherever sea level is rising, we're seeing an uptick in the frequency of these lesser extremes. Great, thank you. I'll leave the question box open for two more minutes. Again, if you have any questions about climate related phenomena or activities in the Southeast, feel free to ask. Do we have any last comments from any of our panelists today? Okay, it looks like that's it. Once again, thank you all for joining us today. We wish you a very safe and happy holiday season, and we look forward to uh, having you join us in January for our next webinar. Thank you. Bye, Meredith. <laughs>